Tao, and um, I'm actually uh, going to present to you about um, the traditional Chinese culture, but through a, the lens of uh, Shen Yun. And uh, um, my presentation will be two parts. Uh, first, we'll talk about the traditional culture, and then, you know, with Chinese New Year coming up. And then at the end, I'll introduce uh, some online resources. I hope that will be uh, very useful for you, um, for everyone, to learn more about the uh, Chinese culture. So the uh, title of my presentation is the, A Journey to the Land of the Divine, A Look at the Traditional Chinese Culture Through Shen Yun. Now, how many people have heard about Shen Yun? I have. This poster is all over. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, anyone uh, heard about the phrase, the land of the divine before? It's actually, this phrase is directly a translation from um, Chinese for one of the ways uh, Chinese people call the land of China. Um, it's a, a term from the ancient times. In Chinese, it's called the Shenzhou. Um, the term comes, uh, it, it's called this way because um, the Chinese people believed that the culture has been bestowed by the divine from a time frame like 5,000 years ago. And at that time, the deities and the immortals coexisted on earth um, in the land of China today. And the deities taught the people uh, in China how to live according to the heaven's way. And that includes um, how to, uh, like from the, the kings, how they rule the land and in daily lives, how they um, carry on the daily activities. So uh, we know that China is one of the uh, one of the most ancient uh, civilizations on earth. It's not the longest necessary, but it is unique in the sense that it has a non-stopped, uh, it has a continuous record of written history um, for about 5,000 years. Uh, the earliest book we find today um, are from like 3,000 years ago, but the historians back then had access to more uh, books that we don't find today, but they recorded from even um, longer period. And so with that, and throughout the dynasties, there has been numerous number of uh, cultural relics and national records and uh, uh, just literatures and uh, legends. It's a, a vast, uh, immense cultural heritage for all of us to enjoy. So now what comes to your mind when we talk about Chinese culture? Anybody? Well, when I think about Chinese culture, I think about Chinese New Year. And as a little kid, we always get these uh, hong bao, the red mm -hmm. envelopes. And I think, I think about respecting parents, filial piety. Those are things that come up. And of course, great Chinese food. <laughs> right. yeah, Chinese food. Yeah, I think a lot of people may be muted <laughs> on the presentation. So I came up with uh, these ones. Um, so art. Can you see my cursor? Oh, my cursor doesn't work on here. So for example, the um, on the uh, left of your screen, you see this Chinese painting. Um, it's just one of the styles. There are other styles of uh, painting, but you know, typically with uh, some poetry on the blank spots. And in this particular one, just black and white ink. And yet um, we feel, you know, not necessarily missing the color. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a different um, style emphasize on the on the uh, subtlety of the landscape there, and of course ceramics, and the, the upper right corner. <clears throat> excuse me, you see that uh, terracotta soldiers. That's um, unearthed from uh, the tomb of the first emperor of the Qin Dynasty, from about two thousand years ago. And there were actually um, 8,000 of them, each with a distinct facial expression. And they're like six feet tall, you know. Um, it's amazing uh, masterpieces. And actually recently, 
uh, recent years, scientists have found uh, some mysteries about them. I, when these figures were first unearthed, there were colors. They, they didn't look like this, um, the clay color, when they were um, uh, for just unearthed. They had very vivid uh, costume colors, the green, the orange, the bronze, and then they quickly uh, faded out into this clay color. But in those uh, pigments of those dyes to their, to their outfit, uh, when they were first unearthed, um, the scientists found something very, very advanced related to today's most advanced technology about superconductivity. Uh, so, and then we turn this uh, clockwise to the upper right corner, of course, T. And then the bottom middle that uh, Chinese food, right? Take out food, the fortune cookie. I don't know if you're aware that this uh, fortune cookie tradition actually started in America. Uh, now they're, this, some people in China use this uh, tradition as well. I like it. I mean, I go to Chinese restaurants in America and I find this, I find it's fun. Um, but that's um, just one little part of the Chinese culture. It's very inclusive and adaptive. Uh, in fact, uh, throughout history, there have been inputs from surrounding areas, different ethnic groups, different cultures brought their um, excellent you know, uh, elements into the Chinese culture. And so Chinese culture is um, multivariate, yeah, very inclusive one. And um, many people say that they, they feel close. They feel like maybe they were past life in a Chinese or some, something. So it, it is, um, no surprise. Um, about Chinese New Year. So there's, uh, Tina, you mentioned there's some uh, customs like a uh, hong bao and that's uh, for, to give gifts. And here I listed several others. On the upper uh, left corner, we see this uh, firecrackers. It's actually one of the uh, inventions uh, in, from ancient China that um, we know we now have the firecrackers here too, right? It, the idea was to, uh, on the Chinese New Year's Eve, and people uh, have these firecrackers, and later on, they're fancy versions of fireworks, but firecrackers just for the sound of it, and to uh, blow away the anything bad luck like lingering around from the past year, so welcome a new year. Um, and then the upper right corner, the line dances. Uh, you probably see this in some martial arts academies. Um, we have line dances, dragon dances to celebrate the year. And the lower uh, right corner I have here, these um, actually the, the, you see the banners, the red banner on the red uh, paper. Those actually they're, Poetry, you know, and then there's on the top, there's a, a horizontal one. And usually, words of, you know, they have to be on the same number of words, and then there's certain requirements of the rhyme. It sounds beautiful and with uh, good intention, good wishes um, to say bye, goodbye to the past year and welcome the new year with good uh, wishes for the success and prosperity of the family. Uh, of the community. And on the door in the middle, you see these uh, pictures. These are door guards, uh, supposedly, usually uh, in this, we, we can see very clearly here, but um, in the legend goes that in the past there were uh, generals and uh, after they passed away, they become these guards and the ghosts, the ghosts or bad things will be, they are afraid of these uh, door guards. And these door guards are appointed um, by the divine to you know to guard the door. That's why in the new year time, uh, families will put this on their door. And of course, dumplings, right? And uh, let's see. Uh, the from when I was little, my dad always told me that um, when he was growing up um, in kids' time, the most important thing activity during Chinese New Year is actually to pay respect to the divine. And when he was little, the, the elderly in the community would uh, 
make sure he gets up early, in the, very early, because he's the oldest son in the family, and he can the, his devotion, his um, dedication, uh, uh, sincerity actually can uh, represent the family in some way. So that's the uh, one of the most important activities actually to um, be grateful for the divine's protection throughout the year and uh, show respect um, and then uh, looking forward for the great new year again. Now, um, that's just about Chinese New Year. So now let's uh, talk about something um, about the Chinese culture that some people find it uh, could be a little bit subtle or mysterious. This is a quote from a book called The Book of Changes, Yi Jing. And if someone uh, studied Tai Chi or familiar with Chinese acupuncture, they probably have heard about this book. Um, it's from 3000 years ago. Uh, in it, there's this quote say, the invisible and intangible is the Tao and the visible and tangible is just a container. Here, the Tao means it's spelled as T-A-O, but we, when we pronounce it in Chinese, it's almost like D-A-O, Tao. Um, that's sometimes you see it written as Tao um, in some other context. It's a, a, just a different ways of romanization, the Chinese character. But the Tao here means the way, uh, the path, the truth, the method, uh, the real thing, the essence, so here it is, the invisible and intangible is the Tao, is the essence, right? And the visible and tangible is just the container, that the that's the box that contains the in essence. So in a way, we think of this, um, no matter how beautiful, how fancy the container, the box is, it is still what's in the box that matters more. Um, actually, this is not just unique idea to the Eastern culture, the Chinese culture. Um, in the West, uh, Plato had a quote saying, uh, like, what we perceive is just a shadow on the wall. What we, it's a shadow on the wall, right? So what made the shadow, that's the real thing. But what we see, it's just the shadow itself. Okay, so... The rest <clears throat> of the first part of the presentation, I'll talk more on the essence of the, the you know, the Tao, the, what's really in the box of the culture and the destruction and then the revival. Um, Chinese people consider the Yellow Emperor as the beginning, the founder of their civilization in this past 5,000 years. Now this Yellow Emperor is not the emperor, what we call the first emperor, whose tombs had those uh, terracotta soldiers. That was from 2000 years ago. This yellow emperor uh, lived 5,000 years ago, it was during the time when um, the deities and the uh, mortals coexisted on earth. And later on that first emperor, you know, from him to, from the yellow emperor to that first emperor, there were about 3,000 years, right? So why he called himself, why people, uh, later on called him the first emperor. It was in the, um, back in the days during yellow emperor's time, that was 5,000 years ago, this word emperor actually, the di in Chinese, it means the ones with the divine, uh, divine characters, with the divine qualities, divine um, uh, realms. Um, and, 3,000 years later, the first emperor of Qin dynasty, he um, kind of boasts himself having those qualities. So he gave himself the title uh, using the emperor. Before him, um, the kings before him didn't use the his title. So he kind of elevated himself to that level. So he gave himself the um, title emperor. And then uh, he says it's the first emperor. Later on, people called him the first emperor as well, continue using that. So now let's back to this uh, great yellow emperor who is considered the beginning, the founder of the Chinese civilization. Uh, he actually is a, he studied the Tao, Taoist cultivator uh, from a Guangchengzi, a deity. And let's see my screen. And 
he's uh, yeah so his uh master the Taoist master taught him how to rule his land according to the heaven's way and uh, you know gave him the the legends that about their meeting and he's him asking a question and his master giving him instructions. So he taught his people uh, the proper way to live. And during his time, there were lots of inventions, uh, including the make of uh, music instruments, the set of tones of the temperaments, 12 um, page temperament actually. And then the uh, invention of drums, um, and then the setup of uh, the proper attire, clothes of for people to wear and then uh, during which occasion to wear what. And one of his wives, the Yellow Emperor's wife was um, the inventor or rather she just had the secret uh, how to make silk, to raise silk worms. Um, so that's, the, the was the fashion uh, time for to you know make the fabric and uh, design costumes and people had this um, uh, it's the the proper manner you know, in the society and also uh, how to build houses um, there were also uh, medical medicine Chinese traditional medicine uh, development at this time as well. Now, 2,500 years later, a, another Taoist uh, called Laozi, great sage, he came about and systemized these thoughts from the Yellow Emperor's time on. Cause, so we know that the Taoist thoughts has been, you know, from the very beginning of this um, civilization, of Chinese people's civilization. So Lao Tzu systemized this uh, thought and wrote a book called uh, the Book of Tao De. Uh, the Taoism is formed and in it he focused on the truth, you know, trying to expand the mysterious way of the universe. Um, but the Taoist, uh, Taoism thoughts focused on truth. Around the same time, oh, let me minimize this screen so you can see more screen. I minimize this sidebar. Can you see the full picture of the of the? Uh, yeah, the we can see the full picture. Oh, you can see the full picture. Okay, of the, okay. Uh, on my screen, it's a um, sidebar blocking it. So on the uh, right corner, right side, I see this uh, about the same time as Lao Tzu, another great uh, sage appeared. I I'm gonna let you guess his name. He's considered the teacher of all teachers and his thoughts has been the foundation for the Chinese society following him for more than a thousand years to select uh, officials, select uh, civil officials and has been uh, a very important component of the Chinese culture and the Chinese thoughts. Anyone can guess his name? All right, ta-da. <laughs> Is it Confucius? Yeah. Yes, you're right, yeah. Confucius, right. So Confucius taught the five cardinal principles, Ren Yi Li Zhi Xin, that's in Chinese, though the in English roughly translate to compassion, uh, justice, um, propriety, like um, etiquette, uh, wisdom, and uh, faithfulness or truthfulness. Um, I see actually a uh, various uh, variations of these translation of these words appear in many organizations, uh, corporate or um, or just um, associations uh, principles, their 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 values. I mean, just from there, I see how deeply related we are from different background, different culture backgrounds. These values we do share. We look all different, right? <laughs> but on the, that's on the surface. Um, but we treasure the same thing, same important thing. And then um, about the same time, another important thing happened in the East. And this came to China about 500 years later. 
that's uh, Buddhism. Uh, so in Buddhism, the emphasis is on compassion and benevolence um, to reach uh, self-salvation uh, and then um, offer salvation for others. So all three, this uh, Taoism, uh, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, they formed the bedrock of traditional Chinese cultures and thoughts. And we can see all three focused on moral self-discipline, self-improvement, and the uh, veneration for the divine. I mean, the terms are different, different religion, you can say, but the, the general idea is there. And um, in the Chinese society, actually, there are families with uh, some are Confucius scholars, some went to the Buddhist mon uh, monastery or temple, and some become Taoist. This, um, it's not, um, it's very inclusive method. This uh, faith, this, believe these thoughts coexisted in harmony. For example, actually, um, these thoughts um, influenced the Chinese culture and Chinese people's daily life in many, many aspects. In fact, let's give an example of Chinese Kung Fu. You know, all, you all know this, right? You know, Bruce Lee, the famous Kung Fu star. Yes. And another famous star. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> They're great, right? Um, but in China, if you ask people who has the best kung fu, uh, in China they will give you different answers other than these two. Uh, the first answer they have two answers to have the best kung fu. The first one is uh, Shaolin, Shaolin monks. Um, actually, the People say that's the Tianxia Kung Fu Chu Shaolin. It's the origin of martial arts um, in the world. It comes from Shaolin. That's, that's just a phrase of saying, right? Um, the, these monks, actually, the Shaolin, uh, Shaolin Temple existed before uh, Bodhidharma, who, was a, who used to be a prince in South India. And then he became a monk, a Buddhist monk. And then uh, after learning the Buddhist uh, um, teachings, he came to China, he wanted to spread the Buddhist teaching, and then he went to Shaolin Temple, eventually settled down there and taught the monks uh, this method to, uh, for uh, physical exercises. And then also has, um, it's a good defense, um, but mostly at the beginning also physical exercises for themselves. And another answer Chinese people will give you about the best martial arts, the highest level is uh, Wu Dang, Tai Chi. That's the Taoist practice. Uh, the Tai Chi, probably it's the one of the most familiar things in the West uh, about the Chinese martial arts. Uh, tai Chi was invented or was founded rather, not invented, founded during the Ming Dynasty about 400 years ago by a great Taoist called Zhang Sanfeng. Um, he started his Taoist uh, practice in his 70s. So it's never too, too late to start. <laughs> he started in his 70s and then he reached um, enlightenment later on. And people have different ideas of how long he lived. Some people saw him in, when he was about 120, 130 years old. Um, and later on, just nobody saw him. Yeah. So, uh, Tai Chi, when it first started, actually had a set of uh, theories, theories and uh, uh, not just the physical movements. Uh, I think nowadays, most people only know about the physical movements, um, the principle, the theories, which it's uh, guarding the heart, the how you are, the mental, the, the mind part, and it's lost, unfortunately. So on the right side, you see this picture is rotating background. That's the symbol of Tai Chi. And the Chinese character is just imposed on it. It's, it's the Chinese uh, calligraphy for Tao, uh, for Taoist. For, that means the, the way, Tao, the, the, the truth, the, the path. Um, this Tai Chi that, that is rotating 
you see it's um there's black part there's a white part there's black in the white white in the black part those two those taiji kind of fish like um shape rotating and that there are um other color representations of this symbol um, at different level because this is a, a spiritual practice that Taoist Taoism right so there are this symbol has different colors in different uh, spiritual enlightenment levels uh, but usually you see on the uh, in some uh, like acupuncture or Chinese medic Chinese doctors or clinics um, it's usually just a black and white uh, represent that's called the yin yang yin and yang and the idea is in there's yin and yang in many things such as day and like day and night um like a man and a woman um and so hard strong masculine versus the gentle soft the feminine um yeah the balance of it and the combination of it that's important for how things should for how things will develop and uh, sustain um Another example of how these principles uh, influence Chinese society, for example, uh, the four no official, the four no. Uh, here it's a story from the Han, Eastern Han dynasty about uh, 2000 years ago. Yes, that's the Han dynasty. Uh, a famous scholar called Yang Zhen. He was a higher uh, rank official in the military as well. And one night he was visited by one of his student and subordinate. And they chatted, chatted until it was late in the night. And student brought out some gold on the table and said, uh, oh, my great master, please accept my uh, you know, uh, as gift. And Yang Zhen said, you should know better. How can you bring, how can you do this? This is bribery, right? It's, I cannot take this, but you should have known better. And this student said, oh, but you know, it's so late and uh, nobody around, nobody could see us. Uh, they just, please take it, don't worry. And Yang Jin said, what do you mean nobody sees, nobody knows? You know, I know. Heaven knows, the God knows. So his student took the lesson and felt embarrassed. And, uh, you know, that's, um, that's his lesson from his uh, mentor, from his master. Uh, so that they left the legend of four no official, the you know, I know, heaven knows, God knows. Um, in, even today in Taiwan, I heard there's uh, bookstores, they call the four no bookstores, and the uh, others pharmacy, uh, they name themselves four no pharmacy, just um, showing their determination to be honest. Um, even when they're alone, even when they see there's nobody around watching, they know that they're, they're being watched. So that's, they would um, uh, guard themselves to, to behave properly, you know, instead of falling into some temptations. So that's just an idea, uh, another story. And in fact, throughout Chinese history, these uh, thoughts that from the teachings from Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism has been the guidance um, for every, uh, type of human activity at their highest level. For example, martial arts, which has said Chinese medicine, architecture, uh, how to rule a country, how to build a city, um, culinary arts, and military tactics. And yeah, um, I don't know if you just noticed one thing. Um, when we talk about martial arts, the highest level of martial arts were either from the Buddhist monks or Taoist cultivators. Don't you think that these people should be you know, peacefully meditating <laughs> instead of having the best kind of martial arts. <laughs> um, that's another story. In fact, the Chinese character for martial arts, it can be taken to two parts. It literally means stop the weapon, stop the fighting. So the highest level um, of, uh, of war is to um, let the uh, invader retreat without fighting, to stop the fighting, stop the the you know, the, the conflict. It's also considered the best kind of martial art, stop the conflict and not necessarily resort to violence. 
Um, and but all of this kind of tradition actually came to a sudden stop in China about you know what, how long was that? Thirty-seven years ago, from nineteen forty-nine. You all know what happened in nineteen forty-nine, right? Anyone? Yeah, communists came. Okay. Yeah, very unfortunate. Chinese um, communism uh, took over China. Um, so, you know, before to follow those traditional teachings, people would do meditation in the morning or adjust their mind before they carry on any activities, even for a carpenter or for a scholar, for a painter, artist, right? But um, since 49, when the communists took over, um, they forced everyone to give up these traditions. The reason being that communism in its core, it's um, atheism and it wouldn't have been too much of trouble if they just themselves believe in atheism. Um, they force everyone else to believe in atheism. So that means they started a massive, um, one after another, not just once, massive destruction of anything related to the Chinese tradition. Um, that being, for example, here on the left corner, these pictures are taken during the Cultural Revolution, uh, which happened in 1966 to 1976. So, uh, but there, that was just one period. There were other times um, as well throughout the past 70, seven decades. Uh, on the left, lower left corner, these were Buddhist, a pile of Buddhist uh, sculptures being burned. And there were people who were just on the back look, and we don't know how they feel, how they felt, what they were thinking. On the right side, you see this, um, this uh, tablet, it was a tablet from the uh, Confucius homestead. It, it was there for 2000 years. And there were people pulling, trying to pull it down with the ropes, people line up, it's like a tug of war kind of thing and pulling it down. Now that, what happens when these visible and tangible things were destroyed? What happened to the invisible and intangible? When people had fear, in face of this visible, tangible violence, this threat. And what's hurt, what's really got hurt, it's the, the in their mind, their tradition um, and their faith um, and the willingness to share, to pass down that tradition. In the past, when people, many people didn't know how to read, they're illiterate, but they know stories from the past. They could sing, um, they heard songs. Uh, they tell stories to their uh, children. Um, kids learn stories from their grandparents. You know, it's the, the, the values passed down that way. But when communists took over, in my own family's case, for example, when I was young, um, my family actually, uh, my parents restrained themselves from telling me more because there was, danger when the little kid uh, just slipped something um, in the kindergarten, in grade school, um, the whole family could be in trouble. Uh, I almost got um, the whole family into trouble once. And uh, luckily the, my uh, kindergarten teacher was friendly. She just tried to basically tried to make me aware, uh, don't say that kind of thing again. But that's kind of, that, that kind of restriction on people's mind and also restriction on um, the old from the older generation to pass down the essence of the culture to the younger generation. And as a result, the younger generation um, lost the opportunity. And uh, much of these about the culture I had to relearn um, when I grew up, when I come to America, uh, when I have more access, and when I have, when I can ask these questions more freely and uh, explore and uh, read books that wasn't a lot wasn't available to me before. Um, so some people say, oh, but that was from Cultural Revolution right? 50 years ago. Uh, it's no longer like that now. Well, um, I'm, I'm just gonna be brief. The culture's shell versus substance. Th this was the, the Confucius um, homestead tablet. Luckily this piece was just broken into half and then they glued it with cement. Uh, but many other pieces were smashed into you know, beyond repair. But when this thing was restored, did the 
invisible and intangible part get restored as well? Sadly, no, because the Communist Party, first of all, they are unwilling to, because that's their core. I mean, to restore these uh, traditional faith, the values, um, in, which implies the divine, which people believe their culture was bestowed from the divine. And, you know, just the fact of so much um, inventions, so many inventions during uh, Yellow Emperor's time, um, it's not just some people from like cavemen um, figuring out things, right? There was a big uh, uh, explore rapid development culture-wise uh, during that time to allow people to stay in touch with that tradition. It's the, um, it's a threat to them, to the communism. They consider that way. Um, and so in, they not only smash the antiques, they burn the books, they also jail the scholars, heavily punished um, anyone who was trained in the old way, um, being the scholars, uh, old style martial artists, the old style medical doctors. Uh, and then they release them from jail after they were told so, uh, suffer so much and uh, had the fear in their mind, worried about the survival and safety of their family members. So, and then they are, they with this, they themselves, the, even the people in power, they don't know the essence of the Chinese culture anymore. So they're unwilling to and unable to restore the essence. And with that comes with the, the total um, destruction of the moral fabric you remember, remember that the, the traditional values emphasize on moral self-discipline, self-improvement. So we see a lot of things, um, unfortunate cases of um, you know, fake product, poisonous, harmful things. Um, and then with the globalization, it even comes to America. I mean, it's the Chinese people there suffer the most, right? With such a destruction, um, what can you do? How can you solve that problem? Luckily, a group of artists came up with their solution. Um, in 2006, they gathered in New York and created a company, formed a company called Shen Yun. And through their arts performance, they tried to uh, bring back these old values from uh, the traditional culture. So nowadays you see the Shen Yun's poster see China before communism. That's what they try to bring back. And uh, just storytelling through dance um, and music, live orchestra, a classical Chinese dance is the hallmark. And I'll just be very brief to this. And uh, uh, it's related to martial arts, some of the the, the, the postures, the, the, the movements. Um, and the gymnastics um, borrowed a lot of the uh, movements from the trainings from the cl classical Chinese dance. So, you know, if you know Chinese uh, gymnasts are, have been quite uh, successful because they borrow these techniques from the um, dance and has a live uh, orchestra that combines the Western and Eastern instruments together. Um, I was going to actually to show you some uh, audience feedback of the of the uh, result of their performances. Uh, Shen Yun has been doing for 16 years. They've been traveling all over the world and um, all major cities in North America, Europe, Australia, uh, they're just not allowed in China now, unfortunately. And Chinese people who go, who want to see Shen Yun, they will have to go to South Korea, go to Taiwan, Japan, some come to here or come to America to see it. And one thing very special about the uh, classical Chinese dance and Shen Yun's performance, um, it's actually the bearing, the inner essence. This dance form uh, differ from ballet. It's another system with a very comprehensive training style and it uh, can portray the whole spectrum of human emotions. Um, and it's called the bearing, the inner essence. And in, in the old traditional style, um, you know, the purer your heart, the better your art. So these artists, in order to deliver that pure um, purity to the audience on stage, they 
try to improve themselves first. They have the spiritual cultivation and then they do the meditation themselves, just following the old style, the traditional style. And you can see why this cannot be allowed in China by the communists right now, right? Um, let me see if this, you can see that. Located in New York State, Shen Yun Performing Arts mission is to revive the traditional culture that had almost been lost. Classical Chinese dance is Shen Yun's main art form. And most original Shen Yun music is created for its dances. It displays China's traditional melodies. Just like dance, music can also present different times, places, characters, and moods. China has five millennia worth of culture, from the melodic styles of over 50 ethnic groups to grand imperial court music and lavish folk tunes. This heritage is an endless source of inspiration. The music also embodies this. We have to get the form of the music right. For example, the ladies of the Tang court were very elegant. During the Qing dynasty, the princesses had this noble air. The male dancers are masculine and vigorous. Like the Tang imperial drummers, it's all drums and brass. On the other hand, the female dancers display gentle beauty. So you hear more strings, pipa, lighter instruments. Creating Taoist music, we go for a mystical air and a strong sense of integrity. Buddhist music is solemn and merciful. The tongue monk embodies this dignity. The key changes of the same melody, the late motif for the monkey king suddenly becomes nimble and playful. As for Pigsy, the trombone at the bottom accentuates his clumsiness, and the suona on top gives you this very comical feeling. And in each corner of China, you find different customs and styles. Northeastern music, for example, tends to favor the suona. The regions south of the Yangtze River tend to use the pipa a little more. Mongolians use a lot of vibrato and other ethnic groups have their own unique styles and characteristics. Located in New oh, Okay, yeah. So um, that's actually, uh, Tina, do we have a few more minutes or here stop? Yeah, I think uh, maybe we should stop because we have another session at 11 that's coming up, okay. but we can continue with uh, Nan and you again next next time. We'll work with Shen to get another session, but this is beautiful. It, it looks like this one is, is deserves another session by itself. So beautiful. Right, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, so before, I would just want to add one more min uh, one minute uh, here. I want to share in the chat, because uh, uh, I know Shen Yun just finished in the Bay Area. Um, if you want to learn more about this, this is a great resource. Uh, you can go on shenyun.org. Uh, to learn more about it. And then we have a website uh, to explore the shenyuncreations.com to see more of such videos and uh, how to, um, you know, their, their stories, uh, backgrounds about the each story. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank for you so much, Jen. This is beautiful. Thank you, thank you Asian Art Foundation. Thank You're you welcome. so much. That was really thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Take care, Jen. Take care. Thank you, Jen, for pulling this the last minute. Yes. So I just, uh, yeah, I just connected with Nan. Uh, he's confused about time because originally when I, when we uh, scheduled this, it was for 12, uh, 12 p.m. noon. So he thought it was 12, even though we changed it to 10 p.m. I sent him an email, but he didn't notice that time problem, change. No problem. We'll do it again, okay? We'll talk yeah, about it. He actually rescheduled his meeting to 10 p.m. 10, 10 so he can you know, do the presentation at <laughs> 12. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Mm -hmm. okay, thank I, you. I know there's explanation. <laughs> thank you, Jen. Thank you, Shen. Take care. Okay, sure, take thank care. You. Yeah.